Do you know that your mindset is a habit? Your sense of personal power is a habit. The quality of your relationships is an outcome of your interpersonal habits. Your net worth is based on your money habits. Your business success is built on your entrepreneurial habits. Your ability to create everything you desire is directly related to your habits. So I'm glad you're here right now listening to the Max Potential Habits Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Amanda Barrientes, the founder of NFA Coaching, and every week I'll bring you tips, tools, and inspirational interviews that will help you learn how to cultivate strategic habits that will set you up to be a NFA Habits Master so you can create the life and business of your dreams on your terms. Now let's get to it. Hey, hey everyone, welcome back or welcome for the first time. I am doing a pre-intro intro intro today and this is because I wanna give you a few announcements and also introduce our guest properly, which I didn't do quite in the intro that you'll hear in a few minutes. Being new to podcasting, I am learning so much. I'm learning who to bring on, how to introduce them. I really don't do any edits. And so when I'm listening to them again to piece it all together with the intro and the outro, I'm like, oh, I didn't really introduce DeRay well. Something I realized is that uh, I didn't say that DeRay and I I met through someone else on Instagram, and you'll hear about that in a minute, but the reason I have a business crush on him is because when I was asked to be on his podcast, which is called Before the Millions, I got this sheet that shows that he is in the top business podcasts sandwiched between Tim Ferriss, Dave Ramsey, Gary Vee, TED Talks Business and Bigger Pockets. For those of you who know business podcasts, this is a huge deal. DeRay's podcast is kicking ass. He has over 100,000 downloads, and when I got to interview him for this episode today on our show, he was around a hundred his 100th episode. And Something, it's just so cool because, you know, this is a newer podcast, the Max Potential Habits podcast, as you all know, and he was like totally willing to come on, share his wealth of knowledge, even though, you know, in the win-win scenario, I don't have as much opportunity for him to grow, but he wanted to come on and share what he knows and his background and his history. And I just think the podcast community is so awesome. So I'm really psyched to bring him in today for all of you. And As you'll notice, I changed the intro and the outro of the podcast because I want to broaden it out a little bit to habits in all areas of life and business. I was promoting it just as a business building podcast previously, but, you know, when we had uh, Reverend Lee on and he was talking about relationship habits, I just felt so inspired to think about who I can bring on in every area of life. And there's so many different people with so many incredible stories. So I am just incredibly inspired to grow this community. So help me out. If you're listening right now, drop what you're doing and give the podcast a review, blast it out on social media, share it with a friend. I know that today's interview is long, but I promise you it's gold. You can break it up into two parts if you need to listen to it in separate sessions or go for a really long run or hike while you're listening. I know it'll bring you value, and I want to bring you value every week. If you have recommendations, you know people that you think would be awesome to bring on for interviews, DM me on social media, at NFA Coaching is my handle on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or go to my website, nfacoaching.com. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. I'd just love to get your feedback on how you're enjoying this show and what you'd like to hear more of. And here's intro number two. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back or welcome for the first time to the Max Potential Habits podcast. Today, we have on a special guest that I want you to give the warmest welcome to. He has a wealth of knowledge in so many different areas and very specifically in business development. And uh, 
he's going to bring so much good stuff to us. So let me introduce him and then we'll get started. DeRay is a successful real estate entrepreneur and business coach. He mentors overwhelmed and unfulfilled employees in the professional world through the process of creating and building a lifestyle business through real estate investing so they can escape the rat race and live a life of their design. Oh, love it. While simultaneously growing his passive income portfolio of real estate assets and business accolades, he's channeled his burning desire to help others by urging a change in their beliefs about who they are and what type of lifestyle they're able to achieve with the right mindset focus, and leverage. When DeRay isn't working, he can be found traveling, trying new cuisines, volunteering at Start of Hope, and on his social media platform of choice, Instagram. I love Instagram. <laughs> so let's welcome DeRay. What is going on? I am so excited to be on your show. It, it's an honor, first and foremost. Um, and I hope I can live up to what you kind of spilled out. Hopefully I can add some value to your audience. I'm super excited. Oh, we're psyched to have you here, DeRay. This is a big, big day. Okay, first of all, I want to say just a little backstory for everyone. This is the power of win-win relationships so, and, and social media in building your business. So I, uh, probably about a month ago, well, maybe not even, maybe three weeks ago, I was on Instagram and there was this really cool post that I clicked on and I always read people's bio and if it catches my attention, I'll generally like send them a DM and I ran into this guy named Zachary Beach, who's a real estate guy. And he, I think he might have ended up responding to me and saying something like, hey, let's connect and, and see how we can create some collaborations. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool, let's connect. And we ended up doing a podcast interview together. And at the end of the podcast interview, he was such a cool, amazing guy, so into creating win-wins. And he's like, you've got to meet my friend, DeRay. <laughs> And, and then I was like, absolutely sure. And then I looked him up and, you know, I had that moment of like business crush where I was like, this guy is amazing. You know, so you, to me, just you, the, the, the trajectory of your business, which we're going to talk about with everyone today has to me, looks like it's been phenomenal and, and intriguing and very strategic. And I know you talk a lot about being systems based. So I want, you know, just share with us some of your background, like, where it came from, how you got started, and and then we'll go from there. I love that. I love that, and I appreciate everything that you've said. I, I really, really um, hope that hope that we have a lot of fun. I know we're, that we're going to have a lot of fun. Oh yeah. Um, let me let me let me let me take it back to where do I start? So when I was a kid, I'm going to take it all the way back for us. When I, I was a kid, <laughs> when I was a, I used to um, I used to visit my mom's best friend and my mom's best friend was our neighbor. So she was about two houses down and she was a single mother with two kids, a girl and a boy with the boy. Uh, he was a little, he was way older than me, probably like 10, 15 years older than me. Um, so we always played video games. I always played with his friends. I always lost. They were just so much better. Um, so on and so forth. And then with her daughter, which she was about 10 years older than me as well. Um, we would play Monopoly. And this was my first time ever really just sinking my teeth into something that was fun. It was a game, but there was a lot of strategy involved. And I realized that through that experience, I realized this way later on, but because as, when I played her, I literally lost like every single game for maybe like a year. Like she was just, I just like, she was just that good. And I was like, how can you be that good in a game that's just random and chance? And then over time, I slowly realized that the game was random and it did have a lot of chance, but there was a lot of strategy involved in the game. And I started to realize that occupying certain board spaces, going back to my expertise in real estate, yielded more profits than occupying other board spaces. So I was always fascinated by this concept, but I never really did anything with it. Um, fast forward to college, right? And I decide to get a safe, secure job because I had no idea what my success was going to be like I had been groomed my whole life to be a successful person. It was something that was expected of me. It was something that other people knew was always going to happen. I was always in gifted and talented programs. I was always skipping a class or I, I mean, skipping a grade or I was always being transferred to a school. So up until college, like I was just like, I felt like I was on this trajectory to be the super successful person that was going to take care of my family. 
in college, I mean, the, the same things happened in, in high school and middle school. Like I started running and leading a ton of organizations. I started being on a ton of boards. I started like literally, like, I'm, I felt like I was taking over the campus. Um, and then they told me like, again, I had no idea what success was going to be for me. I just knew that I was groomed for it. So they told me in college, because I didn't know what direction to go in, that if I wanted to be successful, I needed to go find a secure, stable job. Like, okay, I can do that. Um, I don't really know what my passion is. So what do you think I can do? So it, it, it turns out that I like numbers, or maybe I thought I like numbers. Maybe I still like, I really don't know if I like numbers. Um, that's another story. <laughs> but at the time, I guess I was really good with numbers. And um, something about accounting just seemed like pretty stable, right? And everybody agreed with me like, yeah, this is one of the most stable industries, so on and so forth. But they said, hey, direct. Now there are tiers in the accounting world, similar to like law firms. And there's like a million and one accounting firms in the world. And then there's like a top 100. And then there's, there's what's called the very top four. We call them the big four accounting firms. And they said, if you make it to like one of these big four accounting firms, it's like the Harvard and the, and the Princeton's and the Yale's of accounting firms. Like you're, you're, you're going to be like set for life. I was like, dude, I got, it's like, you know, going to oil and gas, it's like working for Exxon or I actually got an offer from, uh, from kind of Phillips. So it's like going to one of those major oil and gas companies, um, but in the accounting space. So I was like, okay, well, this is the goal. This is the plan. And this is now my new trajectory in college. I did a ton of things to actually get um, to get an offer from my accounting firm, but I ended up getting an offer from a big four accounting firm. And I accepted that offer above any other offer because I was just like, dude, this is going to be like, this is a dream come true. You know, so the track was, and the track still is, you work at an accounting firm for 12 to 15 or 18 years and you'll become what's called a partner. So you can buy into the firm. And at that point you'll start making half a million dollars a year or just about that much. Right. Um, so that was always the goal. And that's the goal for a lot of accountants and a lot of people in that space. You just want to keep climbing the rankings until you get to a certain point to where you're making comfortable money. So um, when I started working, I'm a big traveler, as you read in my bio, like I love traveling international. It's what I do. It's I want to eventually be able to go on sabbaticals for like six to eight months at a time and not come back. Like that's that's kind of my, my goal and my vision. But I've always been a big traveler. And once I started working full time at this accounting firm, like all of that went out the window. <laughs> and it wasn't as though I was no longer traveling. It was, I started traveling to only places that my clients needed me to travel. And so let me give you an example. I would be hanging out, chilling on my couch on a Sunday afternoon. I'd get a call or an email from my manager saying, hey, in a few days or maybe even the next day, like you got to go, go to San Francisco and you got to be there for three weeks. Now, I love San Francisco. Like if you tell me to go to San Francisco, I'm packing my bags and I'm getting on that plane. But what's different about the accounting world is it doesn't really matter where they send you. You're behind four walls and you don't see the light of day. They didn't tell me that part. <laughs> so I literally felt like I was still at home. I was still in my accounting firm, still in my cubicle. I didn't feel like I was in San Francisco whatsoever. I was out there for three weeks and I was like on a team that literally hated me. Like, I know that's a strong word, but they literally hated me. And there was nothing I can do to win them over. Like I could bring gifts and all these things. And I was just like, man, this, this sucks. Wasn't making good money. I, 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 didn't get along with anybody, anybody on the team. I wasn't controlling my life. Like I was just like, I'm working to enrich a client who in turn is enriching the company that I work for. So this company can prosper. And I'm doing that 24 seven, or I'm doing that when I'm at work. Now let's talk about money really quick for the first half of the year. I'm working to pay taxes, Dr. B. <laughs> I'm working to pay taxes in the form of, um, I mean, all the taxes that come out of your check, like it's almost like half, right? And then you think about sales tax and all the other taxes that are involved. I mean, quite point put, put plainly, like, let's just say 50% of your money goes to taxes, which is not a far stretch for a lot of people. If 50% of my money is going to taxes, that means I'm working from January to June <laughs> just to pay taxes. Like, in, think about in office settings that you don't even want to be in <laughs> and you're thinking, so, I, I, I would put, just popped into my head as you're going, like, I was groomed for success, but you're like, what kind of success? Right. Like success yeah. by whose definition? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. So I, I worked for the first half of the year to pay taxes. And then the second half of the year, like I was fresh out of college. So you got student loans, yeah. you got mortgage payments or rent, you got uh, credit card bills, you got, uh, what else do you have? Um, 
you got you have all these bills, right? And all these bills, they trickle down somewhere and they trickle down to a place I like to call the bank. <laughs> all your credit cards go to the bank. Your student loan payments, that goes to the bank. I mean, everything that your mortgage, that goes to the bank, right? So your car note, I mean, that all goes to the bank. So you're working the second half of the year to pay the bank. So again, the first half of the year, you're paying Uncle Sam. The second half of the year, you're paying, you're paying the bank. And throughout that whole year, you're working to make a company more prosperous. And at the end of that year, I was just like, well, what, right, what did you do for yourself? And it would be, it would be nothing. Like I, I would have nothing to show for myself, like literally nothing. And I was just like, I can't travel. I'm not building anything. I'm not inspiring anybody. I'm not doing anything worthwhile in my eyes. Like I'm just pushing numbers on a, on, on a spreadsheet. Like I don't even, I can't even fathom what the bigger picture is for the client that we're serving. Like I was that removed from that. Right. So there was no fulfillment anywhere. And I was just like, this is, this is, this is not like, people are going to be disappointed in me. I mean, I'm disappointed in myself. Like this is not what, what I signed up for, you know? So I started searching and I really got depressed. I really, really got depressed because I felt as though I needed to be successful before 25 and I had, I didn't see it happening. Like all the scenarios I drew up in my head, like there was just, it was just wasn't possible. Right. Especially waiting to be a partner. Like if I waited on that track, I would, I would be successful at 38 or 40. Like I just didn't, that no longer was appealing to me when I saw so many people, again, social media is not a good thing to, to kind of be on sometimes when I saw, when I saw so many people living like at such a young age, living a life that I knew I could live and that I wanted to live and that I deserved. So there's this woman, I call her my guardian angel one day out of nowhere. She's like, Duray, you know, maybe it's not out of nowhere. Cause she knew a lot of the things that were going on, especially with me and the team that I was on. And I told you about the team in San Francisco. So she was like, Duray, you know, there's this book that I've been reading and I think you should read it. And she handed me this little purple book. I, I, I hadn't re read a single book in my life at that point. Like in my adult life, I hadn't read a single book. And like the closest I came to reading a book as, as an adult was uh, Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power. And I would read that book year after year, mm -hmm. just like the first chapter. And then like, I would just never, ever like continue. I would just, it would just be a constant cycle until she gave me this book. And I told you on my, I mean, we were just, I was just interviewing you on my podcast and I told you that now, like for the past three years, I read a book a week. Yeah. Like, so I'm, I'm well over a hundred books, but I hadn't read a single book before the age of 25. And she handed me this little purple book. And if you guys know what that book is, it's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, and nice. I was, I was so taken away. I was just like, wait, this is real. People, people, people live like this. There's, there's this thing called passive income and I can travel the world and I can make money and it can just be in my account, like on the month, every month. Wow. I was so, I was like, this, this is, this is, this is witchcraft. <laughs> I was just like, this is witchcraft. Right? Like I can sleep and wake up and there's money in my account. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, literally a month after reading that book, I closed on my first property. Wow. So you really like, like instantly put what you were learning into action. Yeah. Cause, because I that's knew, impressive. I knew I said, if I don't do this now, I'm going to be like everybody else and contemplate this for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years for the rest of my life. I never do anything. So I either do this now and there are a ton of outcomes, right? But every single outcome would be a growth outcome would be a learning outcome. Let's say I fell flat on my face and I didn't know what I was doing. I at least tried. That's more yeah. than I'm would do and the experience that I that I that I garnered from that situation I could use that experience to do a better investment so wow. I, had, I had no fear I was just like I got my my biggest fear was not getting started as soon as I found out that information because I knew that if I didn't I wouldn't get started because that's how we're wired right wow we on, well you know how we get on these highs like after courses or after books and we feel or after a seminar right you just feel like I'm just I'm ready to go take over the world yeah and then you you get back to your, if, if it's like out of town, you get back to your hometown on Monday morning. You're just like, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, and I noticed this about so many people that go to seminars. It's like, it's almost like the seminar itself was the work for the year, you know, and instead of putting it into action and implementing it. So that stands out to me as something really important to highlight to the listeners is like put into action what you're learning and you can massively transform your life. And, you know, Totally. People ask me this all the time too. And you know, I love that it was a book for you because it was a book for me too. That was like this critical pivotal moment where I had all these light bulbs of like, I have the power to change my life. It, like it blew me away. And, and that was a $12 book, you know, like that is, that is it. incredible. Yeah. yeah. 
So do you, so when you call her your guardian angel, is it, do you know who she was? You, you did have a relate, like you knew her. Okay. Yes, I knew her. Okay. And she just knew like, Ooh, I bet she saw something in you. She was like, this guy's driven. He can take this far. Like, what do you think made her give that to you? When I say I have no idea, like I probably text her like a year ago or two ago. And I was just like, Hey, like, I know we haven't talked like since I worked at like the big four firm and I know she's still there. Um, and she's probably doing amazing things. She was doing amazing things when, when I was there. Uh-huh. Um, I just want you to know like how much of an impact you've had in my life. And this was like, when I first started my podcast, I didn't have that many rentals. Like, I mean, I was really just beginning, but at that time I felt like I had done so much and it was because of her. So I've, I've reached out to her a few times and let her know like what she's done in my life, but she's literally somebody I don't have much of a relationship. That's with. That's so she, cool. She just, she was just like, Hey, I'm reading this book through And I really like, she's just, she was just always that type of person, like really super helpful. But, um, yeah. I don't know if she saw something, maybe she didn't, but, um, she wow. That's really, really neat. I love that. Okay. Awesome. So then, so this was how many years ago that you got that book? This was the sum. This was in April of 2016. Wow. Okay. So you've had like massive rapid transformation. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. again, like May of 2016, I bought my first property. Like I, I was playing <laughs> no games. <laughs> okay, um, cool. How many properties do you own now? Now I have eight. Now I have eight. So I, I pursue a little bit of a different method, but okay. um, but now I actually have eight properties that are cash flowing. Okay, eight properties that are cash flowing. Clearly, you've left your accounting job. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> actually, my accounting, my accounting job left me. Um, so I, so what's funny is as soon as I read that book, I had I immediately created a a two-year plan. I know okay. people create 10-year goals and five-year goals and nobody really ever like would think that, you know, the goal that I've created, you can do in two years. But I, again, I just believed, right. Or I was super ignorant. Right. And when you're ignorant, yeah. you're like, you know, so I was yeah. like, Hey, willing to take risks. <laughs> I just told everybody, I was like, you know what, I'm going to make a two-year plan. And I'm just going to build up my income to like leave my job and escape the rat race. Like that's just yeah. what I'm I'm going to be free from all of this by 28. Nobody's going to see me anymore. I'm going to be gone. Like that was kind of my plan. Um, That didn't work out, but a year and a half into that plan, I was approached by, and I can still remember that morning, a year and a half into that plan, I think I had five properties and I was approached by, um, I don't know how long I want to make the story. So I'm thinking about where to start. <laughs> I'm going to make it as short as possible. I was approached by um, my superior and she asked me one day, she called me into her office. I was raising money for a, um, for a 300 unit apartment building in uh, Dallas, Texas. And she asked me, was I soliciting at work or was I raising money from, um, from people at work? Hmm. And I, was like, I was like, no, I, I wasn't. And I kind of had an idea where she got that from, but Long story short, we had a conversation about that. We had a conversation about a few other things. And at the end of that conversation, it was ultimately decided that I should no longer be employed at the firm. Oh, wow. The decision came out of the fact that I was a real estate investor and the firm that I worked, this was after I worked at Big Four. Um, So I was working as an investment analyst for a private equity hedge fund based out of New York. And um, the decision came down to the fact that the investments that I started looking to pursue, which were apartment complexes, very similar aligned with the investments that the client that I was working for pursued. Ah, uh, okay. So, um, again, not to get into minutia, over, overall, there was, there, was, um, there was a way in which I could have actually showed them that that was not the case, that these were the type of investments that we were investing in as opposed to the investments that they were investing in. I could show them the proof and all this good stuff, right? I had a whole bunch of stuff to back this up because I never wanted to be in any type of legal trouble or anything like that, right? So yeah. I, knew, I knew that I was doing right. But again, this is a year and a half into my two-year goal. I had already started my podcast. I had gotten quite a few rentals. And, um, I started, I started dabbling into coaching and consulting. So I was creating my first course. So I think about my confidence level at this point, yeah. I'm creating a course in which I believe is about to like change the world. Um, I'm, 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 um, I'm raising money for this huge deal in Dallas, like huge deal. Right. And then, um, and then everything's going well with my rentals and my, my, my podcast and my brand is picking up. And I'm just like, you know, this two year goal, as much as I'm not ready, I'm nowhere near ready. Like five rentals is nowhere. Isn't like, I'm nowhere near ready. Right. Um, but 
at the same time, I know that I'm spending 60 hours focused on this thing that's not really driving my future. Right. Um, if and I if you shifted all hours, that time to something, yeah. to what you really wanted to do. Wow. Yeah. That, that, that I, I felt as though that's when things would really take off for me. I was just okay. like, I can't spend the time that I want to spend in my businesses to really grow them. So let me just yeah. not... Maybe this, maybe this is for a reason. Again, I'm, I'm, you know, I, ha I think that there are these paradigm moments in our lives to where we have to make some type of decision. And I wholeheartedly believe, I could be totally wrong, by the way, but I wholeheartedly believe that I could have kept my job that day. Um, but I argued so much to not keep my job because I was that, <laughs> I, it's almost like I was that cocky or I was that confident about what I had going on that I was just like, you know what, I'm ready to leave right now. Yeah. And it was funny because she picked up on that vibe and she was like, okay, well, we can make that happen. And she said, do you, know, do you need to go back to your desk to get anything? Most people, they have a ton of stuff like family pictures and portraits and all these things on their desk. Like they deck it out, right? I didn't have a single personal item on my desk from day one of work. Wow. <laughs> so I was like, um, no. Yeah, you were ready to leave the whole time. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm, can I go? She was like, yeah, sign here. And you know, that was it. Wow. Okay. Tell me in that moment, did you feel, what'd you feel? Liberated, scared, all, everything? What'd you feel? Before it happened. So before the initial conversation, I was very scared. I, I called my mom. I called a few other people. I was just like, I have a feeling this may be my last day at work. So I just wanted to get you guys' opinion on what you think I should do. I know there's a chance that I could keep my job. This is before, like, I, I really knew what was going on. We had the conversation, but I was, I was definitely scared. Like I was scared but at the same time. There was an overall calm feeling knowing that I was only there for a specific purpose. Yeah. Now going back to that, that book I read, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, there's a chapter in there where he talks about, uh, and I haven't read the book in, in probably like three or four months. Like, I normally read the book once a year. I haven't read the book in probably like three or four months. But there's a chapter in there where he talks about utilizing your work, or utilizing where you are to help you with your overall goal, right? So I was like, yeah. how, can, how can I take this and utilize this to my best advantage? So when I was at Big Four, I learned like the accounting uh, side of real estate. And that's like looking in arrears. It's like looking backwards, like at, at things that have happened. But I wanted to learn how to project things, right? I wanted to look forward. And in order to do that, you need to learn the finance side of real estate. So instead of going back to school to get my MBA or get something to teach me the finance side and add another, you know, 40, 50, 60, 100K to my student loan debt, I said, why don't I go find a way to get paid to learn this aspect of real estate? So I went to go get a job as an investment analyst and now I'm getting paid to yeah. learn exactly what I need to learn for my business. That's so brilliant. Okay. <laughs> I, I love this. And I want to point this out to everybody because it's something I talk to people a lot about. Like first that piece of, instead of just like, there's a moment at which to take the leap, but there's also a moment to go, okay, stay stable in my current job, learn what I can use it as on the way as a stepping stool to get paid while I learn. And then when you take the leap, you don't, you're not in this like free fall, desperation, fear, freak out. <laughs> and so it supports you. And then, but then there's that moment where you really do. It's like, to me, it sounds like you were like, okay, no more comfort zone. I have enough confidence. I'm just going to go for it. And it's the time because here's the opportunity. And you just like went for it. Yeah, I did. I did. And it was amazing for all of 10 minutes, maybe nine. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing for all of 10 minutes. And then, um, things started to fall apart, um, literally. Uh -huh. So every single thing I had going, starting from my rentals, um, you know, I was starting to plan evictions. People were starting to report that they needed things fixed that cost thousands of dollars. Um, the course that I was creating is a, that, um, is a course based on house hacking, a method to living for free. Uh -huh. And um, I just thought that it was something that the world needed. Um, which of course it still is, but the way I presented it and the way the notions that I had about it and the way I went about building that course, um, it wasn't the smartest way to go about doing things. I know that you're creating a course now, so maybe this would be something good to touch on, but yeah. um, I built that course, Blood, Sweat and Tears for about three, four months. And um, I expected at the end of that, when I finally released the course that it would bring substantial amount of income, right? Uh -huh. um, especially because I now no longer had a job. Um, same thing with raising money. I was raising money for this, for this deal. And I expected like, Hey, when we close on this deal, it would bring us, bring a substantial amount of income. So I knew that I was going to be good towards the end of the year. Um, so as time slowly crept towards the end of the year and I released my course and I start to realize that 
nobody's really committing to giving me any money for this deal. Um, so I may not raise any money. So this starts to really become a reality for me. So I put my all into the course thinking that, mm-hmm. man, like, at least like the course is going to like be able to like shoulder the burden. And I released the course and um, Dr. B, I had uh, $0 in sales in that course. And I put my blood, sweat and tears in that course for about three to four months. Wow. And not a single sale. Like I had a ton of people go through like the free version of the course and kind of go through my funnel, but nobody ever wanted to pay me a single dollar for what I had to offer. And I was just like, wow. So what's going on with me and money? Like I can't raise money. I can't earn money. Um, All my money's going out the window in terms of expenses and repairs when it comes to my, my rentals, like what, what is going on? Right. And um, that December, I hired my second mentor. My first mentor was a real estate mentor. My second mentor was a business and personal development mentor. And he started to help me cultivate a real business from the ground up. Like he just kind of looked at my business. Like, okay, let's just start from scratch. Let's start with what you're good at. And then let's start with your target market. And then let's start with what value you can offer them and let's build a product around that and so on and so forth. And I realized like I started from like step eight where I should have started from like step one. Yeah. Um, so through that process, he was like, okay, we need to validate that people that there's, that there's value here. So hey, forget about a course, forget about anything right now. And he decided that I should come out with just one hour coaching. And I think that, so first off my money beliefs at, at that time, I think that my course was like, I think the course was free at the, I think the course was free, but if you wanted to me to help you through the course, it would be like $150 for like uh, three different one hour sessions, something crazy. So it came out to like $50 an hour. Right. Uh And then he told me, he was like, Hey, you need to do one hour coaching and you need to raise your prices significantly. Like at first we did, we worked through a lot of mindset exercises. I went to his house in, in, uh, in uh, Ohio and like, we literally just delved into my business and um he got me to i want to ask you something really quick so okay so you're at this moment where you don't have a job you're losing money you're spending money you're not earning any money and then you hired a coach yeah i want i mean i want the listeners to hear this. right oh i'm so glad you touched on that right (laughs) i'm glad you touched on that because i don't some the things that we think are very normal i guess like when you kind of play it back i guess well that isn't very normal but most people would probably tuck their tail at that point like guarantee if i walk walk you through the severity of how bad the situation was. Most people would probably tuck their tail. Yeah. But I had made a commitment to myself that I was going to do this or I was going to die trying. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So you were all in and you were willing to take the risk. Did you have a savings built up from your job from before, but it was nothing. Okay. So it was like credit card. You like hired a coach on a credit card. Okay. Exactly. So I got to the point to where all of my resources were depleted and I literally started living off credit. And I was like, man, like it, it's, this has to work. Right. Yeah. That's, it, it's crazy because that's the same way I felt about raising money and starting my course because I felt like I was depleted and every single time, like I would find reserve, like in the tank and it's not financially, but it's more so, it's more so mindset. Right. Um, because yeah with the mindset, the, the resources that you need will come. I think you mentioned that you didn't have the finances to, on my podcast, you didn't have the finances to sign up for your first uh, course or something that was $5,000. Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, you had tenacity, right? And yeah. You, you oh yeah. Sure. I was like, I will do whatever I have to do to get into that course. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of the same principle, but yet and still, I didn't reach success. Like he was like, Hey, you start offering one hour coaching and I, and you I think he got me up to a hundred dollars an hour, which I was like, no, people would pay me a hundred dollars an hour. Like, no, like this, I'm so scared. Like I can't, I can't charge that. And by the, by the end of his workshop, he got me up to $300 an hour. Nice. And I was comfortable with that. And I was like, okay, $300 okay. an hour. Yeah. One hour calls. And I promoted that for like the next two months. Still nothing. Okay. And were, <laughs> at that point, what were you coaching on? Was it real estate? Yep. So it was real estate, okay. it was, but it was okay. a certain form of real estate called house hacking. Okay. Um, so, so again, and still nothing. And so you're just sitting there going, Oh crap, money out, no money in. I believe in myself. But what I hear in this so powerfully though, is like, you believed in yourself. You're like, I got to make this work. I have the resources. Something's got to pop because I believe I can make it happen and I'm going to die trying. And that, and that's, that's exactly what I like. And 
you know, that mindset, right? Because a decision is something that, you know, the root word of decision is, 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 um, is I'd right. You, you take the I'd in, in decision or decide, right. And yeah. you think about all of like all the ways you can place I'd in other words. So like to decide is to kill off like that root word I'd means to kill off. So like you think about pesticide, right. Yeah. You think about genocide, right? So when you actually make a decision, that means to cut off any other possibility. Yeah. I lo- I lo- a- I, that's one of my favorite words. I love it. It's so exactly. powerful, right? It because is. it means you're committed. You're like, okay, cut that, that opportunity. <laughs> up and I'm going this direction until, you know, I either make it work or I choose, I decide to make a different. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And think about that, think about that, that approach, because I mean, if you, if you, it's like come hell or hot water, like, yeah, this is it. Like your, 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 your neurons, they, uh-huh. they work in such a different capacity. Like, it's just like, you know, it's like fight or flight uh, me- mechanism that kind of just kicks in. Like, I, like this has to work. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So after like trial and tribulation, after trial and tribulation, things weren't working, uh, things were hitting the fan. Uh, I just, I just, again, I just kind of stuck, stuck with what I was doing. I was reading about a book a week. And at this point I started going back to reread books because I realized I, re- I was reading books so fast that I wasn't able to implement the things that I was reading. So now I'm a big proponent on rereading the books that I read and make sure that I immediately implement something. Yeah. Um, but I kept going down that journey. I kept going down the personal development journey. I kept working with him and I kept working with other mentors and started discovering that there was a whole lot of value in myself and that I was undervaluing who I was. Mm-hmm. It had nothing to do with my product. It had nothing to do with my business model, but my business was a direct reflection of me. And when I started putting onus on who I am and what I was able to offer to the world, um, that's when things really started to change for me. Uh, I remember I hired a mentor after, after, after this guy, and this was like a whole team of mentors, like people in a ton of different departments for my business. And these people were profound and the way they helped me set up my system and the way they helped me create my next, like, my second Fourier into my coaching, um, into my coaching program, which now is a workshop. Um, it was so different. Right. So I take the lessons that I learned over the past year, maybe two years at this point, And I brought those lessons along with the new teachings of my new mentors. And like, so one of the biggest things that we did was instead of working on a course for three or four months, putting blood, sweat and tears into it, I needed to prove that I had a viable business. Yeah. So when I created my workshop, the way I created the workshop, the way I built that workshop was I promoted the workshop. So all I did was create like, it was an eight week workshop. It is an eight week workshop. So I um, created the outline. I was like, okay, every single week, these are the things that I'm going to cover in this workshop. Right. Um, Or every single, yeah, every single week in the workshop, but I'm not actually going to create the content. So what I did is I promoted the outline, I promoted yeah. the workshop, and when I got my first co- client, I then like, you create oh, it. Yeah, it is, it's proven. Yeah, and it, at that point, I have a package deal. It's no longer like one hour coaching. It's right. no longer. And then you, know, you and then you're getting paid to to do the work again, right? Like it's that model of like of like okay, I'm going to put the idea out there, see that it's validated by the market, and know that people want it, and then put the work in. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And not only that, but I had, at this point, I had gotten my confidence up so high and my value up so high that now I was able to start charging thousands for my time. Like yeah. I went from charging $300 and I'm making a dime to people paying me thousands of dollars to work with me. And yeah. it was all because of the new value that I had on not only my product, but myself. So yeah. I immediately, and it's crazy because you think about what I'm offering people. I'm offering people financial freedom. I'm offering people a chance to build generational wealth. I'm offering people a chance you know, to take care of their family. Psychologically, you think about the fact that I was offering my coaching for $150 for three three hours. So that's basically saying you can pay me $50 or you pay me $50 and you will have generational wealth. You will have eternity of bliss. If you try to correlate those two things, most people are like, something's not right here. You know, it's almost like the value that I'm putting on that, it doesn't make sense to people. So they would shy away from something like that to what I have over here and I'm charging you five, 10, $15,000 for, and you're like, I believe that this is transformational. So I'm pay for this. Oh yeah. Isn't it wild psychologically? I mean, it's like we pay for what we, we value what we pay for. So if it's free, it could like, you could offer the same product for free and the same product for $15,000 and no one buys, no one opts into the free, but they buy the 15,000. Because exactly. they perceive it having value. 
Exactly. And what and, and, and another good thing about that is you're like, you're like, Dre, that, that, that's weird and that's not good for them. And, but you don't understand how good that is actually for the client, because yeah. I mean, not only the types of client that you're, that you're, that you're bringing into your, into your fold, but yeah. also even the same people that would have came into the fold for a free product and they show up for like a, a high, a high ticket product, they're showing up with a totally different mindset. Oh, right? totally. So, so, you know, again, you, you they're going to have skin in the game. You know, it's like, it's, it's the law of equivalent, equivalent exchange where it's like, if you're giving too much away, people don't, they, they feel like they're taking from you, which creates this imbalanced perspective and energy and it doesn't work. Right. So it's like, you got to go, I'm, I'm giving you tools to transform your life. What is that worth to you? Yeah, it's exactly. A lot of money, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And, and when I started looking at things that way, man, I mean, that, that's when like, I was just like, okay, now I understand what's been going on. I understand my mental beliefs. I understand like I, I was able to start fixing all these things, but all of those are attributed, are attributed to the mentors that I've had in my life. The books that I've had, yeah, pod, podcasts, that I've listened, all of that stuff. It was a culmination of that. And that's why I'm working towards what I'm working towards. Today. I'm nowhere near where I want to be, but I'm working towards where I want to be today. That's and, awesome. I, awesome blueprint to kind of help me get there and have people in my corner to help me get there. Okay. I want to, this, so this brings me to this place. So, you know, for the listeners, when I was introduced to DeRay, I was sent like this sheet of his podcast in alignment with, you know, the top business podcasts up there with Tim Ferriss and like all these big players. And I was like, holy shit, this guy is rocking it. And to me, that's just this really powerful story of how you shifted some, some simple things in your mindset and in what you were doing beliefs about yourself. And then it's like podcasts. So, so tell us a little bit about podcast development, because I know a lot of the listeners out there are in the same boat as us where they're like, okay, what do I want to build my, how do I want to build my business? What do I love doing? And, and what brings people the most value? So tell me like, how did you get into podcasting and, and what's that been like for you? That is an awesome question. And um, so I've talked about my second mentor and my third mentors, but I didn't talk about my first mentor. Now, my first mentor is a real estate investor. And um, at this point, I think he's close to like a half a billion dollars worth of assets under management. So he's killing it. And he has the probably top two or three real estate podcasts out there, like in the world. Okay. Um, what, what, are, what name one of them at least? Uh, his name is Joe Fearless. Okay. Yeah. Spe- so spell his, it for everyone. Joe Fearless, J O E. Uh huh. Fearless, F A I F A. Oh, no, it's, yeah, it's, I can't remember if it's F A I R or F E A R. I think it's F E A R. It's F E A R L E S S. Oh, wow. Okay. And I'll put them in the show notes for everyone listening. Yep. So that was my very first mentor. And um, so I wanted to get into apartments, like I said, so I wanted to learn from his tutelage. And so I went through, I paid him a ton of money. I didn't have the money, like, I mean, maybe like 10 grand. Um, But I didn't, like, I literally did not have the money. I had to find a way similar to you. I had to find a way because I believe that this is what I was supposed to be doing. Um, And then I hired him on a month to month basis after that. Um, But one of the very first things that he had me do and it's counterintuitive because I was ready to jump into real estate. Like I was hungry. I was ready for deals. And I was just like, man, I can't wait to be this like awesome real estate investor. And he said, Dre, here's what I want you to do. I want you to create what's called a thought leadership platform. And I was like, but Joe, like I want to invest. <laughs> I want to start raising money. And he's like, trust me, create a thought leadership platform. And um, it's going to grow organically. And we'll kind of see where things go from there. But after you create that platform, we'll get back to investing. So there is a ton of different ways to create these platforms, you know, going back to your listeners and how they can get started in their specific area of expertise. Um, But I found that there were so many advantages with this platform. But first and foremost, I had to figure out what my platform was going to be. I knew that, you know, for the listeners, I I don't know if everyone knows what it means. I mean, I I know that's a word that gets thrown or a term that gets thrown around a lot. Like to you, what does it mean to have or be a thought leadership platform? So I think that if you, and it's not even having the expertise, but if you have a platform that shares the expertise, because again, when I started my platform, I didn't necessarily have the expertise, but I knew how to extract the expertise, right? So if you have a way, if you create a way to share expertise, right? Okay. You will come off as a thought leader. You will come off as an authority. So let me give you an example. Okay. Awesome. You want to be, you want to be a real estate investor and you have no real estate holdings. You have no idea what to do, how to get started, but you want to start rubbing shoulders with some of the best and the brightest. One of the easiest ways you can create a thought leadership platform 
doesn't even have to be online, which we can talk about a whole bunch of online ways like our podcast, right? But one of the easiest ways is to host a local meetup. Now, you tell two, three real estate investors and real estate agents that are prominent in the area that do the most deals, you tell them, hey, I'm hosting a meetup. I'm going to have people come out. It's going to be during happy hour. There's going to be food, drinks. You're going to be able to talk for about 10 minutes, and then there's going to be Q&A. Every single investor and every single agent is going to want to go to that meetup because they're going to be able to get more clients. Mm -hmm. Then you, on the flip side, you tell the audience, you tell the people who you go to meetup.com or anywhere. Um, and you say, Hey, like this is a meetup. There's going to be, you know, these investors, you're going to learn how to invest. There's going to be these agents. You're going to learn how to get these deals and so on and so forth. Show up at this meetup. Happy hours, totally free, blah, 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 blah. And a ton of people are going to show up. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. And now, now you've put together this, this event, you are not the expert, but you are seen as a thought leader because this is your event and this is something you put together. So you now have in your pocket, these real estate investors and these agents, and now you're known in the community and you can do this every single month. That's great. And then you get to learn along the way because, and then you develop your expertise on your own. So it's like win-wins all around. Exactly. You help everybody. Including so great. Yourself. Awesome. Yeah. Great idea. Okay. To every Okay. So to me, it sounds like when you say thought leadership and it's funny cause I, I, you know, I think of myself as a thought leader and the expertise in certain areas. And then I go like, when people actually talk about thought leadership, I'm like, what is the actual definition of that? And I know that listeners wonder. So it's like, it's really, it's creating a platform around your, it, it's building a brand about what you're an expert in, which could be curating other people's knowledge, bringing people together around a topic, but they see you as like, oh, I'm gonna go to, to DeRay when I need help thinking about real estate investment. He's my man. Exactly, perfect. Cool. Okay, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. So, so I, when, when, I think about, when I think about my thought leadership platform, like the first thing that I, that I was thinking about was that I don't, like if I were to think about it, a YouTube channel, a website, blogs, like all these different things. The one thing that I did not want to do was start a podcast. Huh, really? <laughs> that oh, was the wow. one thing. That was, I, like, I don't know if you automatically knew you were starting a podcast or if you just needed an outlet and then you started to look at the options, but I looked at all the options and I was just like, and you didn't want it. <laughs> I was like, Honey, that's, just, that's been the one that like you've been wildly <laughs> successful. I mean, I don't know if you're wildly successful in others, but I know you are in podcast world. No, that, yeah, that, that was, and it's crazy because I took about a month and a half and I was like, that's the one I'm not going to do. So I started looking at all my options and I, I think I, I came down to, I wanted to build like a real estate forum. Like that's what it ultimately came out to. But I was like, who has the time for that? Right. Yeah. So I crossed out all the things on the list. I was like, okay, you know what? I'll just start, start this dang podcast. And it turned How out to be the best funny. thing I ever did. <laughs> wow. Okay. So yeah, for me, it's been the opposite, but I had fears around it. So like, I thought I got to develop this, this, and this before I can look like an expert in podcast world. And I was a little bit intimidated by creating a podcast. You know, I was like, I don't exactly know what I'm doing. And then I met someone at a conference and I had this great idea for a podcast. And I, I talked to him about it. And I'm like, let's co-host it. And, and for me, that was what I needed to get going. It was like, oh, let's collaborate and do teamwork and then I'll start it. And so him and I just started that a few months ago. And now I'm like, oh, now I get podcasts and it's not that hard. You know, it really isn't. It and is so not. it's not. And I made it into a way bigger deal than I thought. And now, I mean, I always knew I wanted to do a podcast because for me, it was my entry into like access to free knowledge on the go and learning. And I, so for me right now, I'm like, oh, podcasting is my jam. Like I yeah. will be doing it all. I, it's, I love it. I love learning about people. I love sharing information with the people who are drawn to me and, and my work and, and my thought leadership, you know, and it's like, I just go like, oh, cool. I get to meet people all over the world and, and create all these win-wins and just right. share knowledge for free. Like what, right. me, what's better than that? You know, and, and you think about, you think about the people that you're, you're communicating with, like, especially when I first started my podcast, like, I mean, even now, like, especially now, right. I think about the fact that most of these people, if you wanted one-on-one -on -one time with somebody, like just to quote unquote, yeah. pick the thing, which I hate that term, but yeah. you want to time with somebody huh. with you know one of these authors or whatever it would it wouldn't happen in a million years no totally but they'd be like having, i'm way too busy <laughs> pay me five grand an hour or whatever right. you know? yeah but, but having this platform having this podcast i mean you literally yeah. have access to almost any and everybody that you want it's so amazing and to me free yeah you know yeah. so i suggest that all your listeners no matter what industry what niche what field they're in what passion they have get started with a thought leadership platform it yeah. i mean you don't even have to have it fully figured out. Just get started and see where yeah. it leads. 
Would you say, well, this is fascinating to me because generally I, I work with my clients telling them to start with the one that they're most drawn to. And it sounds like that's not what you did. So like, tell me, I want to understand for you it was because like, what made you pivot to podcasts? Well, no, I actually started with podcasts, but it was during the planning phase that I you didn't were like, no. Do. Okay. But then yeah. what made you go? I'm going to do it anyway, even though it wasn't because what you were drawn to. I weighed the pros and cons of every single platform. And I knew that a YouTube channel, um, we talked about video editing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We both were just like, ah. <laughs> so I knew that yeah. I knew that uh, I didn't want to start that way, even though I knew that I may eventually have a YouTube channel. I didn't want to start that way. I was still working full time. I needed something quick. I knew that people who view YouTube videos, they like a certain format. They want facts. They want them fast. And you have to kind of get into that within the first three seconds. I yeah. knew that there were ads, there were going to be distractions. Um, I knew that with blog posts, again, it's for a certain type of person. Not all people read. Yeah. Um, so I knew that there were a lot of pros and cons for each thing, but with podcasting, I mean, it's the one thing that has had a steady uptick for like the past like 10 years and nobody really knows. I mean, I'm sure us in the industry, like we're like overwhelmed with it. We know like it's blowing up, but people outside of the podcasting world, like they're probably, I mean, most people up until like last year didn't even know what a podcast was. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's true. Yeah. Oh yeah, so, there's so, lots of people that I'm like, do you listen to podcasts? And either they're like, absolutely, I have 50 <laughs> I follow, or they're like, what are you even talking about? Yeah. Exactly. So I think about podcasting, and it's the one thing to where you can be really, really personal with your target audience. Like, yeah, full creative control. Yeah. There's no popping up. There's no visuals. There's no, you know, people can be working out. People can be driving. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Can, whatever and you you can multitask you can't do that with a youtube channel you no. can't do that with blog post right and yeah. you know you get you get you get like you're in the earbuds of people right so they're like they're they're getting really intimate with your voice they're learning your story and you're almost building like a relationship with somebody you've never met before you yeah. often get people to walk up to you or to email you like hey like i feel like i know you and you know i've i've, I've heard your journey and so on and so forth like you don't get that type of connection anywhere else i don't think right no um, it's pretty so amazing it's yeah. yeah i i I'm, I'm fascinated by it you know something that really stands out to me that i think is so powerful that you're saying it's like you get i'm getting so many values met for myself where i'm like i get to learn from you right now we're both helping each other build our businesses we're connecting with our audiences and, and then I just go like, I get, I, I, I've written a list of all the people I want to interview. And I'm just like, it, there's an in there. Cause they're like, of course, I want to share my knowledge with the world. And it's not just a conversation between the two of us where they feel like, I like what you said, like picking their brain, you know, like that sounds so invasive. Yeah. Whereas instead you're inviting them to have a conversation, to share their knowledge with the world and their expertise. And it's like, it's just awesome. So I want to ask you, did you, in, in terms of monetizing your podcast, what's that process been like for you? So in the beginning, I sound like the Bible. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the beginning, um, I tried everything. And when I say tried, I don't really mean try. You know how we talk about the word decide and you, you make yeah. a decision? Yeah. That's not what I was doing. So I dabbled into probably 15 to 20 different revenue generating projects for the podcast. Okay. From ships to, um, to affiliates to... I mean, there's even affiliates, you can break that down into so many different ways. Um, I tried a lot and I made money. Like, I mean, there were times where, I mean, so let me start. So in the beginning, I'm, I, like, I would make money, but it would come in like little chunks. Like it'll be like $20 here. I think the most I made like the first year was like $500 for like a ticket sale for somebody else's conference that came on the podcast. Okay. Um, and that was like through affiliate, right? Um, but it wasn't something that I could control. It wasn't something that I had enough downloads or listenership to really mm -hmm. make a type of difference. So I was just like, well, maybe there's an indirect way to um, make money with my podcast, like to monetize. Cause my podcast is very, I mean, I'm sure you can, yeah. it's very expensive to um, like each episode for me, like I'm at least spending like $250 per episode to like release it. Like when I kind of put everything by an episode basis. Right. So it's yeah. not cheap. Um, so I was just like, if I'm not going to, if I'm not going to really hone in on a way to make money directly, maybe I can transfer these efforts to my coaching and my educational side of things because before the millions is an educational platform. So yeah. now I don't do any sponsorships. You won't hear any ads on my podcast. I think I did it for the whole first year 
And I completely cut all that out. First off, I want to be really authentic with my audience. I only wanted to promote people that I, like I actually tried their product and I knew it would work. And I wanted my audience to have that value and trust with me. Um, yeah. So there were a lot of things that I cut out after the first year. And third of all, it wasn't making enough money to really make a difference anyways. Yeah. So yeah. I cut everything out my first year and I started solely promoting my products and the things that I had to offer. Nice. Um, and since I've been doing that, I've slowly gotten back into, well, now, since I'm more established, I've slowly gotten back into some of the earlier things that I've tried. So now I'm doing partnerships, I'm doing JVs, I'm doing affiliates, and they're a lot more prosperous now because I don't need to depend on those things and I can pay yeah. those things. Yeah, it's just supplemental income. Yep. yep. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you're thinking. So, and, and I wanted to point this out to listeners too. When you're getting started with podcasts, you can do it for free. You know, like my, I still do all my podcasts myself. And, and I, I want to do more podcasts, so I will end up outsourcing and hiring help and all that stuff. But, you know, so it's like when you get to a certain level and you're producing at the level that you are, you can find paid resources to help you do it. So I don't want anyone to be discouraged starting a podcast thinking like, oh, wow, I got to pay 250 bucks a podcast. So don't get stuck there. Yeah, you're so right. You're so yeah. right. And I, yeah, and I, I definitely want to touch on that. I, I, I had an article like about a year ago, uh, just based on podcasting, like literally from beginning to end. And I like kind of drew out three different levels, right? If you, if you want to spend like zero to $50 on your podcast, all the equipment that you need, nice. the, the software that you need, what you need to do, because it's possible, right? And then yeah. I took like three different levels and level three is like, Hey, I'm running out like, and I, I would never do level three personally, by the way, but Hey, I'm running out like, you know, studio time. And I see a ton of like up and coming starting podcasts doing this. I'm like, what are you doing? They're running right. out studio to report their podcast. And wow. It, yeah. So there's yeah. different levels, but definitely the, the, uh, the, the zero to $50 way is how I first got started. Right. I yeah. edited all my podcasts myself. Um, yeah. I, I got a, um, a ATR 2100. I still have that. That's my microphone I'm using now. Uh, nice. it's about what, 20, 30, 40 bucks on Amazon and you're yeah. good to go. You plug that into your laptop and you're good. You go to garage band and you're, I mean, you're good. You, yeah. you have no expenses whatsoever. You find a hosting platform. I'm pretty sure you use Lisbon. A lot of people use Lisbon. Yeah. Um, uh, or Liz, is it Lisbon or Liz? I'm using, I use audacity and then I, for my re editing and then I have SoundCloud, but, and but it was 140 bucks for the year and it's unlimited, you know, downloads and all that stuff. So pretty cheap. And similarly, it's like, I have the blue Yeti. It was like 60 bucks. And, and that's, I mean, my headphones that I use for everything, like that's, that's it. it. <laughs> and you yeah. could even record on your cell phone you oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Apps on your cell phone, you know? So it's like, there are so many ways to get started. So, you know, and, and I say this because of being a person who was coming from food stamps and money was a huge limitation in my mind. And, and I did need to start with free stuff. And, and so it was like, I've just built over time and it's getting nicer and nicer. And I could totally see myself. I'm like, Oh, I can't wait for the day that I record. And I just send that baby off and they do all the work, <laughs> you know, but I've built it over time. So I think, so thank you. You know, I just wanted to point that out for people who are listening because they're going to be at all different levels of where they're at in, their decisions around starting a podcast or growing it. So tell me, I, what's your number now in terms of downloads? Um, we recently passed 100,000 downloads. So, yeah. uh, like, yeah, I just want to give you like the big <laughs> virtual high five. That is so awesome. Was Thank that a big, so and I know you just passed, um, number 100 episode too. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm, I'm reaching quite a few milestones. Um, again, in the podcasting world, I think that because you're so personal, you're so niched down, um, you don't need a large audience to really make an impact and you don't need a large, large audience to create a business. Yeah. Um, I'm a living testament of that because I mean, there, I mean, you see lots of podcasters who are like at three, four, 10 million downloads. I mean, that's amazing. Right. But yeah. us like we still we still like a lot of little guys think it's not possible to create a business you know with their podcast or around their podcast and it's definitely possible you know there's a article that came out in 2007 or 8 called a thousand true fans have you ever heard of it no i'll have to read it though there's an article that came out in 2000 and, yeah i think 2007 or 8 called 1000 true fans and it's based off of the premise that you really need in your direct vicinity about if you can get it to about a thousand people a thousand people in various different social media networks and just a thousand people who are truly passionate about what you're passionate about and they want to hear your message. Yeah. Um, have a thriving business with just 1000 true fans. It's so true. Crazy. You know, there, it's so funny looking at social media world hell. There's this whole push to have a 10,000 followers, 20,000, a million. It's like, 
I don't care if I have a million followers because if they're not, if they're just dabbling and it's just random people who are liking me for silly reasons, like if I have a thousand people who are like, oh, I really jive with her and her message and her work and like, oh, the way that she teaches and coaches, like that's a, that's someone that I want to have a relationship with for life. You know, like I go, that's part of my NFA tribe, you know, I'm like, yes, those are my people and Absolutely. you don't need that many. And I'm really noticing that even just in, you know, it's like, I think I have like, I don't even know what number I'm at on Instagram. It's like close to 1400 or something, but it's like, I've been posting consistently for months now. And I'm like, cool, steady growth. And it's the people who are drawn to me and the people that are supposed to be in my world. And I don't, you know, it's like, of course, sometimes I do the comparison thing where I'm like, oh, they're so much better than me because they have all these followers. But I go, you know, just do your thing and monetize through pro my own products where, and similarly, and, and I love that you're saying this because I'm like, oh, cool. I'm doing it. I'm doing a, a path that's similar to yours where I don't plan on having sponsors. I mean, I, I can't say that that'll be a thing forever, but I don't plan on it. And I just plan on going like, Hey, here's me, here's the free information. And here's a paid course. If you want to learn from more from me, yeah. you know, so it's like I use my podcast as a platform to promote my products and people get to know me. So then they go like, would I want to work with her or not? Because I've, they've gotten all this time hearing me talk on podcasts and videos and things like that. And so, so they have so, a flavor of who I am already. So speaking of that, I have a question. Like you think about, and I know you, you, you've, you've done quite a few podcasts already. And I know when I first started, the reason why I, I, I gravitated towards sponsorships and affiliates and all those things is because I didn't have a product at the time. And yeah. I was just like, well, let me try to monetize and some, like, let me try to capitalize on the fact that I know that like, I have this community. Yeah, totally so makes that, sense. That, that was my mindset. So, I'm, so my question to you is, I know that you're, 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 you're just now coming out with your course, but all this time that you've been podcasting, have you been sending your, your, um, your audience to a certain resource? Um, and, and if yeah, you have, so go ahead. what I've done is a really long-term approach. So similarly, I'm like, I know this is my life's work and this is what I want to build long-term. And I've got my vision laid out where I'm like, okay, my goal is to impact 5 million people minimum through my company, whether it's through books, podcasts, what courses, workshops, you know, all those things. And so I've looked at it as this very long term, like I look at like, okay, in the moment, maybe I'm not making any money from my podcasts, or I've been doing a weekly YouTube video every week for the last, I'm on video 46. And I just said, I'm going to commit to it. And I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. And I'm going to, and for me, that whole thing was like, I want to provide value, 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 value. And I want people to start to see me and I need to practice and get better. And at, you know, it was like, well, I don't have a following. So who, who would I even sell anything to, <laughs> you know? And so it was kind of that idea of like, of not build it and they'll come build it attract people keep working and then in that way also doing kind of the validation of concept so figuring out what the people are wanting to hear and what and so that's why i'm creating this money course is because i've had enough people ask me for one that i'm like okay there's a need for that now i'm going to build it you that know so awesome. it's, it's been kind of this it's, it's just been a, you know, an organic approach of figuring it out and, you know, taking some marketing courses and trying to piece stuff, stuff together. And then also go, what jives with me? You know, like I'm not, I can't see myself doing the sponsorship thing. Cause I'm like, similarly, I don't want to sell something I don't care about. Like, I don't, you know, like I, I want to know that what I'm selling is valuable to the people that are following me and, and wanting to work with me and just hear from me. I love that. I love that. So uh, have you decided on what platform you're going to actually have your, uh, your course? Yeah. So I have, I use Kajabi. I don't know if you've heard of it before, but that's my whole platform for my website and all my courses and stuff. Yeah. So I use Kajabi and it's, uh, it's so easy and amazing. I started with WordPress. I don't know what you started with, but I started with WordPress <laughs> and it was a nightmare for my perfectionist self. <laughs> Trust me, I get that. I get that. I started with a. Uh, I started. I started with a build out from a company called uh, Podcast Websites. I use them to this day. I actually, okay. use them from my podcast hosting as well. Okay. Um, in one package, but um, cool. I had a recent. I think I told you earlier. I may have been off the call, but I had a recent um total overhaul in the brand because originally, um, my brand was just like it was just like before the millions and lifestyle design. It wasn't. It wasn't lifestyle. My brand used to be more so before the millions and talking about like how different people have reached like the millionth mark of like whatever it is like they were they were pursuing right it wasn't really okay. focused 
and it also also didn't have a brand at the time. So last year, or in 2017, December 2017, I revamped my whole website. And I know that you're, you're, you, you've done your website yourself. I don't know if your listeners know that, but you, you've actually done your website yourself. I think that's pretty amazing. I actually just, just did the sketches, and, uh-huh. I had, and I did the blueprint, and then I sent it off to okay. my they, they kind and of it. It, but it sounds like you went from like you went combined this large scale down to like the branded scale of branding you uh, and, and okay cool yeah. and now what and your brand is still before the millions but you said it's what else no it's still before the millions but now okay. it's more it's just a lot more associated with who i am like if you go to the website okay. uh, now like you'll see a lot of pictures of me and you'll see lifestyle design because i promote a lot of lifestyle design. I love to travel. I love to eat like different cuisines. I love to be, you know, different places and do sabbaticals. And um, that's, that's kind of, you know, I know that there are a lot of people who were in a, are in a similar position. I used to be where like they're corporate slaves and they don't see a way out and, you know, yeah. they want to have freedom. And I, I, I feel as though when I incorporated the brand into like real estate and what I was doing, it was more personable, but it also showed people the lifestyle and it showed people the inspiration that they probably needed to start taking action. Yeah. I love that. It's so cool. Oh, I feel like I could do a 10 hour podcast interview. <laughs> you're such a wealth of knowledge and you've been there and done it and tried it and it's working and, and you're not afraid to just go, okay, 2016, I'm doing this. I'm going to try it out this year. Then, Oh, that's not working. I'm going to shift and then I'm going to rebrand. And you know, I similarly, I used to be called ABI coaching. So it was Amanda Barrientes Institute, which is this idea that I'd have all these courses. I still have the same concept, but the NFA started really sticking with people and they were like, I love that. And they would remember me by it. And I'm like, it is pretty catchy. And and so I, st- I just was like, same thing. I'm like, I'm a year in, I'm, I'm rebranding. Like, I'm just going to rebrand and go for it. And it changed. It made sense, you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I can't. I can't wait for you to uh, come out with this course. I'm super excited. I mean, again, we talked on my podcast about what you have going on and some of these, uh, some of these money habits. I'm just, uh, I'm just like, man, I can't wait till next month. Or maybe that's a spoiler. So maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. Say that, but... <laughs> that's great. Yes, it's coming. It's coming. Get ready, everyone. Get everyone um, to master your money. Um, okay, so tell us. I mean, we could go on forever, but I don't want. I know that we're in pretty long for listeners. Um, tell me your three top max potential habits that you think have gotten you where you are today? Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you asked me this question, like right before the call, I tried to get three on paper. I got two on paper, Okay. Um, but I know what I'm going to sum up as my third one. So the first one I have on my, uh, the first one I wrote down is working out. Mm-hmm. And I know that may seem like, uh, that's a, uh, you know, that's, that's not really a, habit that's really all that important in the grand scheme of things when we talk about business. I strongly disagree. I believe that similar to you, that there are certain areas in our lives that have a significant impact on other areas in our lives. And I think that the way we are as people reflects on our business, right? So like our business is a direct reflection of who we are. So if you're not taking your health seriously, if you're not working out, if you're not taking care of your body, you're going to have those same attributes in your business, in your relationships. And um, it's one of those things to where I know that if I have this consistent habit of working out every single day, not every single, I think I, um, I do five, five to six times a week, I have this consistent habit of doing that, then I'm building up the mental capacities, I guess, in my mind to know what's possible for me, not only in, you know, my workout life, but in business and in, in every other thing, right? And not only that, but I often have many, many business ideas at the gym, <laughs> many epiphanies at the gym, right? Um, so it's good to kind of just step away from the minutia of your business and just like to kind of just like, hey, like, not only like relieve stress, but like, when you again it's like kind of taking a shower right this is when you just kind of have your most brilliant ideas you know so i think that working out is super imperative when it comes to a habit that you should continue to uh, reinforce awesome okay another one that's big for me is journaling um i am big on journaling um especially this year at in december i read a book called the 12 week year and I don't know if you've read that book, but that book is phenomenal. Yeah, you know I, I listened to one of your podcasts recently and, and ordered it because I was like, ooh, I love this idea of the 90-day plan. Yeah. Oh, goodness. it is amazing. Talk about a system to follow. Um, most of us have this, most of us create one-year goals um, or five-year goals or 10-year goals. And there's nothing wrong with these goals. Uh, but when it comes to our one-year goals, I know a lot of us create New Year's resolutions and that's our one-year goal. But one year, 365 days, 
I mean, that's, that's so abstract. Like you can't really fathom 365 days, right? There's no way you can know today what you're going to be doing in December. Like it's just so far away and it's very hard to have a one-year goal and not procrastinate to try to get things done in the last month or last two months, right? It's called Parkinson's law. Um, so what I do now is I actually incorporate a 12 week year. So at the end of 12 weeks, that is my whole year. So I, whatever my goals are for, you know, my one year goal, I break that down into four different goals. And then my, my one quarter goal is basically what I look at as my one year goal. So I focus in, in 90 day segments and jour journaling helps a lot with that. Um, so I, so this year I've been trying out different journals. I was going to show you one, but I don't have it with me, but this year I've been trying out different journals, different 90 day journals, because I actually want to come out with my own journal next year mm -hmm. because I, that, nice. I think that this is really really key for a lot of us like so so serious like I've seen the results that not only I've gotten but my students and my clients have gotten and it's amazing when you actually write down your goals every single day like you can't run from them you can't pretend that you don't have them you can't like if you miss a goal if you miss a step like you know you have to go face to face with them like I did not do this like every day I write down two I just I just I wrote an article this weekend I said I failed 180 times in the past quarter and that's because I failed twice a day. And I know that I failed twice a day because I wrote down two failures every single day, you know? So knowing, coming to grips with what you're doing every single day and writing that down in a journal, you will see how much faster and further you will progress than if you didn't have that accountability partner. So journaling is the second habit that I would, um, I would definitely want you guys to incorporate. Um, number three is more so just encompassing all of the habits that I do in the morning, which is just having a miracle morning. Uh, there's a uh, author by the name of Hal Elrod and he wrote a book called the miracle morning. And um, he's big on routines, especially in the morning. If you start your day off, right. Um, it bodes well for you throughout the day. I think about the fact that a lot of us, we, uh, we wake up and we, the first thing that we do is we like, we like look what's on our cell phone, right? Like, Hey, what's on Instagram or what's, you know, who texts me, right? Uh, what are, where do the emails do I have, right? What flyers do I have to put out? Man, man, if you wake up with that panic, <laughs> like you read an email, like, Oh my goodness, I have to tend to this right away. Like, I mean, because it's urgent, right? But you often, but most of those things often as urgent, aren't as urgent as you make them. And if you just like put aside your phone for the first few hours of the day, right? You get into some type of morning routine. I don't care what it is for you. For me, like I start with, um, I start with prayer and meditation and then I read my Bible and then I journal and then I do visualiz visualizations and I do affirmations and then I exercise, right? So I go through this routine and I'm up at like five o'clock, but I don't start my work day until 10 because those first like few hours, like that's still part of my work. Like the, the, the rest is work, the exercising is work, the mental work is work. So all of that is business, right? So I, I mean, I start on work day at five, but if you were to ask like a normal person, well, I'm not actually getting to my desk in the office until 10 because right. I'm doing all the work that, you know, I believe is, is the work as well. So having that morning routine just really sets the tone for you to take charge of your days, especially journaling, journaling, right? Because it tells you the single most important thing that you need to accomplish that day. It, um, that morning routine sets the tone for the opportunities that you, I mean, visualizations are powerful, right? It sets the tone for the, the vibrations that you're giving off to other people, the opportunities that are presented to you. So my morning routine is super, super, super imperative. And I want you, I implore you guys to check out the miracle morning and just use that as a basis if you don't have your own, and then you can work off there and kind of tweak as you see fit. These are awesome. And you know, it's interesting asking people the top three habits. There are definitely overlaps and, and thinking about working out journaling and morning blocks. It's such a powerful way to set yourself up for business success, not only personal success, you know, it's like you are the foundation of your business. If you're an entrepreneur, you're a small business owner, or even working in a company, it's like if you have your personal successes set up, then your business can thrive. That's awesome. Those are great. Thank you so much. Okay. So I'm certain that a, a lot of the listeners are going to want to connect with you. Tell us where is, are the best places to connect. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to make it really simple for your listeners. They could just hold, head over to before the millions.com. And that is literally the hub where I share all my articles, insights, resources, courses, client, tell paraphernalia, you name it. Everything's there before the millions.com. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. It has been pure joy to have you on. And I, I know that I met you for a reason. So we're going to collaborate some more because I just, you know, it's like all these things you're seeing. I'm like, okay, check, 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 check. This is, <laughs> you're my kind of people. <laughs> I love you. 
and I also thank you so much for the work that you're, you're, you're doing. I know that there are a lot of um, people out there who they, you know, they, they get into this entrepreneurial role, they start their journey and they start to just kind of hold things within. They don't want to share with others. They think that, you know, they're of the scarcity mindset that, Hey, like if I tell my friends, like, I don't want them to, you know, be on as well and so on and so forth. And we're not, obviously we're not those people, right? We believe in an abundant mentality and, you know, there's not a limited amount of resources. It's not finite, it's infinite. And the more we share with others, the more actually we grow and we prosper, um, which is actually key. So I love that you're doing what you're doing. I love that you have this podcast and this platform and YouTube channel and everything that you have going on because you will prosper because you are helping others prosper. So thank you for all the work that you do and thank you for inviting me on. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. I will be back next week. Have a NFA day. <laughs> I love it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you're liking this podcast, help spread the word by subscribing, sharing, leaving a rating and a review. To connect, go to nfacoaching.com where you can join the Max Potential Habits community and get access to all of my free and paid resources. There's daily inspiration on Instagram, IGTV videos, access to the Max Potential Habits LinkedIn group, and links for working with me in the live weekly Max Potential Habits online group training, the NFA Money Magnet Habits online course, and if you're really serious about taking it to the next level, you can also schedule a Max Potential coaching consult. Until next time, I hope you have a NFA day where you thrive and feel alive.